the law, you know, when people try to follow the law, they're trying to do things or accomplish things through some of the law. Um, the law only reveals that you're a sinner. And it shows the whole world that they're guilty before, before God. So look at Romans chapter 3 again. Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to start in verse 19. And read on down from there. 3.19 Now we know that whatsoever the, the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. We read this earlier. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now... That's one of my favorite two words in the Bible, but now. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by the law of works nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So we went over the gospel in the first uh, half of the today. We explained that it's, it's real simple. And that it can be understood by all. But, what, but for whatever reason people start to stray away from that simplicity and, and what they're saved from. And when we're talking about being saved, we're talking about being saved from the penalty of sin. This is, uh, this is going to be eternal separation from God, which is it's damnation. So the issue is sin, and there is nothing that you can do to deal with that sin. But the Bible tells us that God loved us even when we were yet sinners. And the Bible also says that when we were without strength, Christ died for us, the ungodly. If you keep that in mind, when you, then you're going to continue to have clarity about the gospel. You will never doubt your salvation. Because there is no sin that he did not deal with. Sin could not separate you from God again because Jesus didn't die just to pay for some of your sins. He died for all of your sins. He died... He, for all your past, present, and future sins. Then you're going to understand, you have to understand that you're hopeless, helpless to deal with the sin yourself. <clears throat> Jesus completely dealt with that sin and became the Savior of the world. And when you trust the gospel message, which is, Jesus died for your sins, that's your acceptance before God the Father. God then puts the righteousness of Jesus to your account, and then you're declared righteous. God saves you from your sins and gives you the Holy Spirit, which is the security of your salvation. He seals you until the day of redemption. The whole point is that salvation is from the penalty of sin. If you start to get off track and you start thinking that you can lose your salvation, or you start talking about sins that you committed that you know separated you from God. You got to go back to the basics. Go back to the cross and remind yourself what the cross actually accomplished. Hopefully, if if you're saved, you're you're uh, preaching to somebody in your own circles, and you're trying to tell them the gospel, you're, or you're looking for an opportunity to tell people how to be saved from your sin. Salvation should always be fresh in our mind. Before a person can ever be saved, they need to understand that they're a sinner. 
that God is holy and just. The penalty of sin is death and separation from God forever. They, they cannot save themselves. But they also have to know Jesus dealt with their sin. He made that complete satisfying payment to God the Father for all mankind's sin. And they could do nothing but trust Jesus Christ to be their Savior. There's nothing that you can accept. There's nothing you can do except believe God and what He pro provided for the means of salvation. It's what Christ accomplished with His death, burial, and resurrection. You can only trust that. When you say you trust that, you're depending upon that to be true, and and I know I trust that for my salvation. Then people begin to change things a little when they begin to say, I'm going to trust that, and then I'm going to trust this. All right? So, but if you're trusting anything but that, you're not trusting this. If you understand, follow me. So, I'm going to use Sam for an example, because uh, I don't want to point anybody out here. But listen. Okay, so I want, Sam wants to go to church tomorrow, and he needs a ride. So, he asked me to pick him up. I said, okay, Sam, I'm going to pick you up at 9 o'clock tomorrow. And uh, you know, so the night goes by, and I go I go and pick up Sam at 9 a.m. So I'm sitting there, he's just about ready to get in. 9.05, the Uber pulls up behind me to pick up Sam. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I said, and I asked, I said, what's going on? You know, I, I, you don't trust me to... And that I'm going to be here to pick you up? He says, yeah, but I'm just, I wanted to make sure in case you slept in. You know, I still, I'm trusting you, Ruby. Well, I just wanted to make sure in case you, wait a minute, now, you're not trusting me. You just show them you don't trust me. You know, you, by calling the Uber to be here at 9.05, <laughs> you know. So you understand what I'm saying on that? If you're, if you're not trusting completely in what Christ did for you, you're just trying to add a little bit just in case. You're really not trusting this at all. So that, and that's the whole point was I'm trying to make is that you you have to be trusting completely in what Christ did for you. You know. If you're going to add something to what Christ did, it's, you know, then you're saying what he did is not enough. If you're going to trust something. You're going to say, I'm, I'm trusting that, but I'm doing. I'm going to trust this too. You're saying what he did is not enough. Okay? You, you can go through some religious activities, um, and then and they're going to declare you to be saved. You know, like baptism or things like that. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, you're saved now, right? Um, so you're saying you're going to trust that. You're trusting that, but I'm going to trust this too. If you do that, you're saying that's not enough. And trusting is putting your faith completely in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your complete payment for sin. People think that sin is not the issue and that they will stand before a holy and just God. That's going to be a terrible day when they do that. They don't realize that they will be eternally separated from Him. They think that somehow by keeping some law, or doing something they perceive God is asking them to do, they will have acceptance with God. But we've been reading, right? Let's look at Romans 3.19 again. We're going to read that. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. The law points out to you that you're a sinner. It makes you shut your mouth and that you need a Savior. And look at down in verse 22. It says, The righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ that is the means by which you are saved. It is also the reason why righteousness can be imputed to you when you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. As the Bible explains in verse 24. Look at verse 24. 
being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is how a person is saved. But the law points out that you're a sinner and jump over to chapter 7 again. We were, we were here earlier. Chapter 7. And look at verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin. Now sin, that's what it makes death right there. Working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Has anyone ever told you that you were, were exceeded in anything? You know, on your job, you're, you're, you're really over exceeded my expectations. Peter, you've done a great job on your job. You've oh, you're you're doing done exceedingly well, right? People do that in this world, right? God's telling you that you over if you go over exceeded the boundaries, you're exceedingly sinful. You know, you've never exceeded in anything. You you've exceeded in sin, and that's what you've done. That's what mankind's done. So Scripture tells tells you that not only are you a sinner, but and that your mouth should be shut, and that you're guilty before God. It also tells you that you have exceeded in sinful. You're exceedingly sinful. That is why you need a Savior. Salvation has nothing to do with you, but salvation is in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to, to make that point that the law shows you that you are exceedingly sinful. We're going to go back to the law again. I want to show you some more. We, we stopped in the first couple commandments there. And where God, what God actually has put in the Bible, what He actually says in the Bible, it'd be wonderful if people would just read their Bible and they would never go to the law to be saved. Never. Go back to Exodus 20. We mentioned uh, the first couple commandments already, which uh, you know you're not supposed to have any other. Uh, no other gods before God, and don't bow down to those graven images, those first couple laws. Okay? And uh, so God starts out by giving these two laws, and the point I'm trying to make in the law points out that we're sinners, and this shows you that God is going to visit their sin in verse 5. Look at verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, thy Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the third, gen third and fourth generation of them that hate me. We need to understand that this is when God was dealing with Israel as a nation, and their sins would affect their other generations as well. And God would judge them as a nation. Turn over to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. We're going to take a look at this. Look at this. Look at this. You can hold your place in that Exodus 20 because we're going to go back to that, but um, just, we're going to just to know we're going to go back to that. So we're going to, you know, this is where Moses is gone, and he's up in the mount again for that period of time. And notice in verse uh, 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. You notice something there? Well, God's telling them they're his people now. You know, they screwed all up, and, and God's telling Moses, it's your people. You're the one who brought them out of Egypt, right? And then the, in, in verse 9, look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked neck, a people. Then Moses begins to debate with God a little bit. In verse 11, let's see here, verse 11. 
And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why hast thou wrought waxed hot against thy people? See, he's telling them it's his people. Which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Okay? So the people that, the, you know, he's telling them, he's trying to go back to what God, you know, God, you brought these people out. And most of it, God's telling them they're here people because they've done this thing. So he's kind of debating with them. And, and Moses, he starts pleading with God, you know, because they broke those two laws already. And they're already, you know, they're already going to receive punishment. So Moses is trying to stop, you know, try to intercede on their behalf. Look at verse 30. And it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto that people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go unto the Lord. For a preadventure I will make an atonement for your sin. They certainly did. They created, they made a great sin. They bowed down to a false god. And God, after God brought them across the Red Sea, and all the things that he had done with all the power, and then they've done it. It's amazing when you think about that. But we do that all the time. You know? um, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, block me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Moses did not bow down, but he wanted God to forgive them. And if he didn't, wasn't going to forgive him. He wanted, he wanted to be blotted out of the book, too. I want, you know, so in, you look at verse 6 of chapter 20, and when he talks about, let's go back to, we'll go over here and look at that real quick. Verse, uh, chapter 20, negotiating this saddle over here. Chapter 20 again. Verse 6 of chapter 20. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay. You know, that comes into play, showing mercy unto thousands of them that God love, uh, that, that love God and would keep his commandments. Just that statement alone, you know, when he, when he talks about that. You know, look at thir uh, verse 33 in chapter 32. We're going back over, I'm going over, I know we're bouncing around, but bear with me here a little bit. Verse 33 in chapter 32. Right after uh, he tells him, you know, you can blot my name out. He says, And the Lord said unto him, Whom, Whomsoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Let that sink in a minute. Whoever has sinned against me, I'm going to blot them out of my book. If, if you're going to follow the law, this is what's going to happen. You get blotted out of the book because a whole world is guilty before God. Moses, uh, so, then you, so everybody has sinned against the Lord. How, how are you going to deal with that? You, you understand what I mean when I point that out? Just that verse alone, that should sink into people. This, that's my whole point. Everybody has sinned, and the penalty is to be blotted out of that book. Okay? Salvation is from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is being blotted out of that book forever. We were Gentiles, and this is what we were talking about during the break. You know, we were Gentiles, and we were already cut off from God. <coughs> we're, you know, we're already dead in our sins. Now, what can we do about that? Right? What can we do about that? There's nothing we can do about that. Only Jesus can do something about that. <laughs> God provided that payment for us. Are you going to plead with God to save you anyhow? This is what people think. I'm going to go for God. I'm going to plead my case before God. Like there's some uh, great lawyer or something that they're going to change God's mind, God's law. It's not going to happen. You know? Israel not only broke the law here, but uh, 
come over to uh, Numbers chapter 25. We're going to see what they did a second time. Numbers 25. <clears throat> Note to self, bring an electronic Bible and working off of a podium with a horse on it. people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. You see, that's the second time they've done that. And Israel joined herself unto <coughs> baal Peor, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them before the Lord against the sun and the fierce anger of the Lord may be that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So here you see Israel does the exact same thing by bowing down to these false gods. And in every case, like before, they rose up to play. And now they're committing fornication too. You know, not only are they putting a God before the true God, and worshiping in these pagan gods, they're uh, inventing their own standard of morality. They have a, they're going to have a worship service and make sacrifices to a fake god they invented, and now it involves their sexual misconduct. So for the for this fornication, the law you know they're they're doing this fornication, they're breaking the law as well, and if we're keeping count. They broke at least four of the commandments already. Right away. Now, now you can see how the law shows us that we're exceedingly sinful. You know what most people think during this time when this society thinks for himself, I should say. You know, they're all sophisticated and they're self-righteous. You know, they're they're saying we're not pagans. Uh, we don't we don't bow down the image and you know, we don't bow down to gods. That's what, they, that's what they say in this society. But to this world, that's what they, they have a different false religion or a different false god. And they call it, and but the Bible calls it science falsely so called. That's what the Bible calls it. And, it, and, and they call it evolution. Right? Just like Israel who created a false god, you they're creating ways to worship this false religion and false god. It's of their own imagination. And it says everything was brought together through time and chance. There's no one to give an account to. There's no such thing as sin, just like they're saying. And there's nobody to give an account to with this evolution because it all happened by time and chance. So back in Exodus 20, back in Exodus 20, <clears throat> getting your fingers worked out today, right? All right, look at verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. God's name is holy, and you're not to take God's name in vain. If you do, what does it say? Guilty. Yep. The Lord will not hold him guiltless. The law shows you that you're guilty before God. Right? So far, you see an illustration of the penalty of sin in these first laws that God has given. 
Let's take a look how Israel did. Go over to Le 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 Levit Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. Verse number 10. <laughs> And is and the son of his in Israelites, yes, I can't say that word, Israelish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him before Moses, and his mother's name was Shiloh, the daughter of De Deborah of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in the ward that the mind of the Lord might be sought. And let's see, verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp. And let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou, and, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, and say, Whosoever curses God shall bear his sin. If you bear your sin before God, there's going to be a consequence, right? So here's, he takes the name of the Lord in vain, and here's the consequence. Death, right? There's not only a physical consequence, but there's an eternal consequence. I want you to look at a verse in Matthew. Hold the place there, Matt, in there. Just turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Is Matthew an Old Testament book or a New Testament book? Old Testament. An Old Testament book. Why do you say that, anyway? Before the cross, right? Can't have a new testament if there's a death of a testator. Now we're in Matthew chapter 12. unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. A person who is lost will give an account of his sin and every idle word that came out of his mouth. What is an idle word? Anybody got any idea what an idle word is? How about representation of the descriptions? How about oh my God. I think that's an idle word. Oh my God. People do that all the time. And, and they're trying to act like they're surprised about something. Like, oh my God. Yeah, I'm giving God no honor. That's an idle expression. You know? Why would a person say, oh my God? Now I'm doing it as a teaching, so I'm trying to honor God here. So uh, most of the time they're just surprised about something. They're not trying to acknowledge God in any way. Um, they're just idly speaking about God and using it that way. Today, it is common even in text messages to use OMG, right? And there's no difference in whether you're texting or saying it, it's idly being done. You're still using God's name in an idle way. It does not honor God at all. You know, so back over in Exodus 24, the point is the guy is using the Lord's name in vain, and they're commanded to stone him until he's dead. Look at verse 16. Uh, Leviticus, back to Leviticus 24. Verse 16. Verse 16. Have you guys spent this much time in the Old Testament for a while? Leviticus 24. And there's a reason to follow this madness here. So, verse 16. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall, shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, 
when he blasphemed the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. God shows them that he means what he says and he says what he means. And this guy gets stoned and God keeps his word. You know, he certainly was going to die. So the law, it can't save you and you're going to, everybody's going to screw up sometime. Everybody is. Everybody has and everybody will. Then the law is going to condemn you. It's going to show you that you're exceedingly <coughs> sinful. There's another message that's also in this passage of scripture which not really a part of what I'm doing, but uh, you can see this Israeli uh, woman's son. She's married to an Egyptian uh, man. And why do you think it is that their son who uses the Lord, why do you think he's the one that's using the Lord's name in vain? And I told my stepson Peter here that I had something to tell him. I said, I want to tell you something. You know, I was thinking about you when I wrote this part down. So the child, you know, the mother and the husband, they're not, they're not equally yoked. They're unevenly yoked. So they're not, what do you think is happening when they're raising this child? She's trying to teach them the ways of, the, of God that they receive. And you have somebody who's not. So they're not you know, participating together in raising a child. So there's a pulling at this, this child. You know, and he doesn't learn the ways of the Lord. As the Israelis did, you know. So that's the believer. You know, we should we should always, as a believer, be looking not to be unevenly yoked, and to see what the consequences could be for being in an unequally yoked situation, and, and the future of your children. And sometimes we put hopes and dreams on things that uh, we want this to change, or this is going to change. I'm going to make you know. But a lot of times it don't change. It doesn't happen. So that's just like a second a les a lesson in there is it will affect your, your children down the road. In their home, there, you know, there, there wasn't proper honor of God when you just have the mom. She, she's trying to honor God, and you got the father who's not. Uh, unlike when there is two parents who have equal influence over that child. God said, don't be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. You can see for yourself what happens to this child. He's going to get, he got stoned. So he loses his life and possibly his eternal life too. So, do you know, there's also, do you know a blasphemer in the Bible? We talked about this during the break today. I'm, Paul was a blasphemer. What did Paul tell us about himself? He said he was before a blasphemer. That's in 1 Timothy 1.13. You can look at that later if you like. His own testimony was that he, he wanted to wipe out anybody who believed in Jesus' name. Paul most certainly blasphemed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives him the message of the cross where all sins have been paid for. And Jesus saved Paul. A blasting. People want to run to the law and it's only there to condemn you. And uh, look at Exodus, we're going to go back to Exodus 20 real quick. Exodus 20. Paul, yes. We also find that there are people who will run to the law in order to attempt to condemn somebody else. Absolutely. And they're already condemned by it. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of what, what it is, is the whole world is guilty before God. You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the law was there to show you that you're a sinner. It wasn't there to try to save you. You know. Um, Exodus 8. Rem remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, and when you read, you get a chance to read Romans 13 on your own and look at that. And, um, you know, Paul's going to talk about the law and how we're going to continue to try to serve that law in a different way, right? Paul tells us that the law is holy and good and we should observe them 
because the Holy Spirit would teach us not to break those laws. We do not do them for our acceptance with God, but they are holy, right and just, and there should be, and they should be practiced in our life. That is every law except for the Sabbath. Every law except for the Sabbath. Why do I say that? And why is it that Paul doesn't even mention the Sabbath day in that chapter 13? Because the Sabbath day belongs to Israel. It does not belong to us at all. Let's look at Exodus 31. And we're going to look at Exodus 31, which I'm going to show that point to you right here. Exodus 31. Verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel and the seventh day of Adventists shall keep the Sabbath to. The, that's not in the Bible, is it? <laughs> Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So you see, the Sabbath isn't for us at all. We can worship the Lord on any day of the week, and we should worship the Lord, you know, and, and do that. That's every Saturday? Yeah, but it's not for us. That's what I'm, The point is that it's for Israel only. And we're not Israel. We know that, right? We're not Israel. And the law was, it says, a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Right? Out of all the law, the Sabbath day was given to the nation of Israel for them to keep because it is a sign between God and them forever. The law was never given to us Gentiles at all. We were never under the law Verse 17, I'm going to read it again. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Sabbath day has no bearing today at all on us whatsoever. We who live during the dispensation of grace should honor the Lord every day. But even the example of the Sabbath, even for the weakest believer, is a good thing to do, right? Even the weakest believer could probably set aside one day of the week to honor the Lord. You understand what I mean? Well, we want to get together with the saints as much as possible and grow in the knowledge of the truth. But even the weakest of the brothers, could, we, would, we would show this as an example that they could put aside one day you know, to gather together and honor the Lord. As an example. Look at the, let's look at the, the consequences if you are under the law about the Sabbath day. Look at Numbers chapter 15. Look at verse 32. And I want to read on down with it. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones and he died as the Lord commanded him. There you go, the consequence for breaking the Sabbath. Get stoned. You're going to die. You should always honor your... And then the, the next commandment after the Sabbath is honor your mother and your father. Right? Yeah. So you should always be honoring your mother and father. And I'll say this to the kids here today. If your parents ever had to correct you in any way, then you know you failed. And you were already broken the law. Yeah. If you want to live under law, then there's going to be some consequences all the time. 
Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. And this is about honoring father and mother, right? Verse 18. 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which would not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall the father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of this city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of, of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Boy, you guys really want to live under the law? I mean, when you really think about that. All right, so... Deuteronomy 27, 27, Deuteronomy 27, verse 14, and the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and put it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say amen okay now if you continue to look all the way down all the way down through 26 it says cursed be cursed be cursed where's all the blessings where's the blessings at all in following along cursed be and they all say amen and they agree with you. every one of these all the way down verse 26 cursed be that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them and all the people shall say Amen. Okay? So you see the law is a curse. There's no blessing in following the law at all. It's a curse to anyone and everyone that's under it. What happened to the blessings? There are no blessings there. Cursed if you do not follow the law completely. That's the whole point. You're cursed. The law is in no way salvation. Even Israel would be blessed in a new covenant, but not by keeping the law. The new covenant would come later for them. So let's see the contrast, and we're going to close this thing out. Look at Galatians. We're going to go to the Pauline scripture now and look at the contrast here. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, According to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, isn't that a blessing? When you read this and you come from the law and you read this, after looking at that law and what the law was as a curse, you can see the blessing of, of what we have today. Why is it that we have grace and peace from God the Father? Because Christ became our curse, right? The gospel is so simple, we are sinners, but Jesus died for us. Look at verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10 of Galatians. Look at chapter 10, real quick. I mean, chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the law, for as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth, not in all the things which are written in, in the book of the law, to do them. <clears throat> See how the law was a curse to you. It's a curse to you. Verse 11. But that no man be justified by the law, but, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just 
shall live by faith. God never said you're going to live by the law. He said never going to live by keeping the law. He said you're going to, you're going to live by faith. Look at verse 12. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hang, everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That Jesus became our curse. So again, when you're talking about being saved, we're talking about being saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus took that penalty. And if you have never trusted Christ before, I encourage you to do it today. That's all I got. Yes, sir. I say that Romans 14 covers a lot of the, uh, the spiritual aspects of keeping the law. But 13 covers a lot of the physical. But, uh, uh, and and God, Paul will generally go over most of that, all the laws. Except for the Sabbath, that was the whole point. He doesn't. He never mentions the Sabbath during that time, because the Sabbath. Was the but he did mention that uh, one man keeps uh, uh, esteemed one day above another. There is no day above, above another. That's right. We we choose this day because if I came over here on Thursday, there'd be no one here. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, the, but if you guys agreed to come here on Thursdays and you all met on Thursdays. There's no problem with that. That's right. Any day. Right. Any day. But the, but the Lord uh, gives us total choice. Absolutely. We should either accept Him or reject Him. If we reject Him, we will pay the penalty of sin because God excuses nothing and no one. Exactly. Uh, someone has to pay that, uh, that penalty of sin, which is death. It's either I accept Jesus a substitutionary death in my place or I put myself there. Someone has to pay because the law says that I'm a sinner. And everyone is a sinner. And, and that it's so simple. Well, it's you no choose shit. life or you choose death. And, and right? The, and life or mouth, death. And when my mouth is shut, there's nothing I can say before God that will influence him and cause him to make an exception for me. <laughs> Right. You're not going to change no because he's holy no and just. He has to be just. If he if he doesn't do, if he if he makes an exception for one, he's not just. So nobody's going to go like you said. You're not going to influence God to change what he uh, determines to be right and just. Nobody's going to influence God to change their mind. So, any, any other comments? I hope that was a blessing to you. And not a curse, right? Cursed be. Now, I was reading that, I was reading that, I was saying, cursed be, cursed be, cursed be. All those verses saying cursed be, and they're all saying amen. You know, everything that, you know, is just going to be, a, the law was a curse. And Christ became that curse for us. So, uh, I encourage you to seek Christ. Choose life over death. Don't die for your sin. Christ died for you already. He died for your sin. If you don't want to accept him, you're going to die for your sin. 